<laughs> lecture 29, more with Taylor series. We're going to look at more examples here in lecture A and those error estimates in more detail. And lecture B, we'll look at <coughs> excuse me, uh, applications to probability finance and physics. All right, so what's an example of the Taylor series we haven't done yet? We haven't done the Taylor series for natural log. Actually, it's often done in the following way. People actually, to, to allow them to do a Maclaurin series, meaning a Taylor series centered at zero, they figure it out for natural log of x plus 1 because when x is 0 in that case, they get natural log of 1, which is 0, and that's nice. But let's, let's go ahead and do it for the natural log itself. <clears throat> Though because the domain of this is all positive values of x, it really doesn't make sense to find the Taylor series at 0. It's not even defined at 0. <clears throat> let's figure out the Taylor series centered at 1. Determine the Taylor series centered at A equals 1. So I need to find the derivatives. First derivative, second derivative, third derivative, etc. And then I'm going to need to plug in A, plug in 1 into those things, as well as the original function. The first derivative is 1 over x, or x to the negative 1. The second derivative is negative x to the negative 2, negative 1 over x squared. The third derivative is positive 2x to the negative 3, 2 over x cubed. Let's go ahead and do one more. The fourth derivative, derivative is negative 6 times x to the negative 4, negative 6 over x to the 4. Now plug in 1 into all of these, including the original function. f of 1 is natural log of 1, which is 0. So there is no constant term. And the reason is because the graph of the natural log function has an x-intercept at 1 f prime of 1 is 1, f double prime of 1 is negative 1, f triple prime of 1, looking at these formulas, is 2, f quadruple prime of 1 is negative 6. I'm plugging 1 into all those formulas over there. So the pattern seems to be that the sign alternates plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, etc. that if you think about that briefly, that will happen, because you keep bringing down a negative power, and it keeps changing the sign of this derivative. If you think about the next one, the fifth derivative, it would be positive 24 x to the negative 5. And at 1, f quintuple prime of 1 would be a positive 24. Those numbers should look familiar. What are they? Factorials. They're factorials, yeah. You could think of this, well, yeah, this is 0 factorial if you like. This is negative 1 factorial. This is 2 factorial. This is negative 3 factorial. This is 4 factorial. It seems like the Taylor series centered at A equals 1 is going to have these for the derivatives. Now remember the formula for the Taylor series looks like this, where the k up there means the k derivative. So in this case, there, the 0th derivative is the original function, f of 1, but that's 0, so we don't need to write down that. When k is 1, we get the first derivative, which is 1, divided by 1 factorial, which is also 1. We get 1 times x minus 1 to the first when k is 1. When k is 2, f double prime of 1 is negative 1. We're going to get minus 1. I'll go ahead and write it as a factorial. Over 2 factorial, because the k right there when k is 2. 
times x minus 1 squared. When k is 3, f triple prime is 2 factorial, but we have to divide that by 3 factorial because k is 3 in this case, times x minus 1 cubed. Then minus 3 factorial over 4 factorial when k is 4. Get a 4 factorial down there. The fourth derivative of f at 1 is negative 3 factorial, though. Times x minus 1 to the fourth. One more I'll write down. Plus 4 factorial over 5 factorial. x minus 1 to the fifth, etc. The factorials don't have to stay there. They cancel nicely, actually. 1 factorial divided by 2 factorial is 1 half. 2 factorial divided by 3 factorial, think about it, that's 1 third. 3 factorial divided by 4 factorial is 1 fourth. 4 factorial divided by 5 factorial is 1 fifth. This simplifies pretty nicely. x minus 1 minus 1 half x minus 1 squared plus 1 third x minus 1 to the third minus 1 fourth x minus 1 to the fourth plus 1 fifth x minus 1 to the fifth, etc. So that is the Taylor series for natural log of x centered at a equals 1. Again, sometimes, actually pretty often, books instead find the Taylor series for natural log of x plus 1 centered at x equals 0. And the answer looks the same, except it's x's instead of x minus 1's. Want to do that? Let's go ahead and just leave the example like this. Is there another way this Taylor series could be found? Mm -hmm. By integrating 1 over x. After all, the integral of 1 over x, at least when x is positive, is the natural log of x. Not worrying about absolute value signs there. But, hmm, how in the world am I going to connect the two? Integrating 1 over x gives you the natural log of x up to an additive constant at least. But I want the Taylor series centered at 1. What in the world should I do to help do that? Well, you could do. <coughs> This is a starting point. Why am I doing this? Let me do one more step. I'm doing this because now that looks like a over 1 minus r. When a is 1 and r is negative x minus 1. And that's a good idea for my goal of getting a Taylor series expansion about a equals 1 because you see a bunch of x minus 1s there. So through a little tricky algebra, you can rewrite the function like that and now use the geometric series formula for a over 1 minus r to write the integrand as a is 1, r is negative x minus 1, 1 minus x minus 1 plus x minus 1 squared minus x minus 1 cubed plus x minus 1 to the fourth, etc. And now integrate those term by term. We could put a constant of integration c in front of you if you like. Because c is going to end up being 0. Integrate 1, you get x. Um, wait a minute. Actually, I'm going to write it as x minus 1, because I want to get an x minus 1 in there. So in reality, I'm treating the constant of integration as c minus 1 by doing that because I'd like to get the x minus 1 in there. Effectively, when I do this, I'm treating the constant as if it's c minus 1, the constant of integration. And that's okay to do. Integrate negative x minus 1. You don't have to expand it out. Just integrate it as is. You get minus x minus 1 squared over 2.
looking good. Integrate x minus 1 squared. Don't multiply it out. Leave it as is. You can integrate that to get plus x minus 1 cubed over 3. Then minus x minus 1 to the 4th over 4. Then plus x minus 1 to the 5th over 5, etc. That is matching this, at least if c is 0. Is c 0? Yes, it is, because natural log of 1 is 0. You want this to equal the natural log of x, including when you plug in x equals 1. When you plug in x equals 1 in these terms, they go away. You're left with c. That should be 0. Natural log of x, you want to equal this when x is 1. We know natural log of 1 is 0, therefore c must be 0. And you can expand natural log of x in the exact same way. <clears throat> I won't write as many terms here. For sake of time. Okay, so yeah, you can find these series in lots of different ways. And it's, it's, I think it's great. You get the same answer either way. Any way you do it, as long as you do it right. The interval of convergence for this thing, converging <coughs> to that, is when the absolute value of r is less than 1. r here is negative x minus 1. We want that to be less than 1. That's the same thing as saying, and get rid of that negative sign because of the absolute value signs, that the absolute value of x minus 1 itself is less than 1, which means x is between 0 and 2. Right, those are the values of x that have a distance, of, distance to 1 that's less than 1. For example, 1.99. 1.99 minus 1 is 0.99. Its absolute value is less than 1. Or try 0.01. 0 0.01 minus 1 is negative 0.99, but the absolute value of that is still less than 1. These two things are equivalent. What about the interval of convergence for this? It could be the exact same interval, or you could end an endpoint or both to the interval of convergence. Give me a second here. You actually can add 2 for the interval of convergence for this, but not zero. When x equals two, the series becomes one minus one half times one squared plus one third times one cubed, etc. It's the alternating harmonic series, actually. And it converges, though not absolutely. If you plug in 0, you get the opposite of the harmonic series, which diverges. So it does not converge when x is 0, but it does converge when x is 2. We've, we've added one point to the interval of convergence by integrating. That can happen sometimes. Question? All right. Just to be clear, the, the top A there mm -hmm. is not the same as the A that you're doing the absolute value of, like x minus 1. That oh, point. yeah. Yeah, the A's are different. This A is where we're centered yeah, okay. for the... Taylor series. This A is referring to the first term of the geometric series. Yeah, yeah they're not the same. Thanks for pointing that out. Although in this case they happen to be the same. They're yeah. one. I just, but in general they're not. Yeah. How good is a truncated version of the Taylor series here in approximating natural log of two when x is close to one? In approximating natural log of x when x is close to 1. How, if we truncated it, say, at the third degree there, if we ignored the higher order terms, how good would that, would that cubic be in approximating natural log of x? Let's use Mathematica to help us answer that question. So f of x is going to be natural log of x, which again is L-O-G in Mathematica. That is natural log. 
Let me go ahead and put my general <coughs> nth degree Taylor polynomial here. I'll call it P sub n of x. I'm not going to bother typing this in with the, with the derivative formula. I'm just going to use the fact that I know the answer here. Right there. That's the infinite series, which equals the natural log when x is between 0 and 2, including f2. Um, let's see here. So we need a summation. k goes from 1 to n, say. If you look at the pattern of the coefficients, they oscillate in sign plus, minus, plus, minus. And the denominator of the fraction keeps going up by 1. So if we're careful here, if we do something like this, negative 1 to the, say, k plus 1 power divided by k times, in parentheses, x minus 1 to the k power. That's a way to write the partial sum, a truncated version of this infinite series. It's only going to give us approximations, not exact qualities. Though we could see the third degree here. Oops. P sub 3 of x. What is its formula? It's that. Uh, in your mind, put the x and the minus 1 together, like I have over here. Then it's the same thing. Yep. How good does this do at approximating f? Let's graph them both. Near zero, near x equals, excuse me, near x equals one. Let's use the interval from zero to two. Technically speaking, the graph of the natural log has a vertical asymptote zero. So they definitely can't be real close when x is real close to zero, but here's the picture. So the red graph is the natural <coughs> log of x. The blue graph is the third degree Taylor polynomial approximation. Actually, let's move a little bit away from zero. Let's make the interval be 0.1 to 1.9 for x. Error, remember, is actual value minus approximate value. And I remember that because actual comes before approximate in alphabetical order. The red graph is the actual, the blue graph is the approximate. It's the approximation. So red minus blue is actually going to always be negative here, except at 1 where it's 0. Non-positive is probably a better thing to say less than or equal to zero. In fact, you could even graph the error as well. You could graph the function f of x minus p3 of x. In absolute value, what's the biggest it can be? If you look at the picture, it seems like the error has the biggest absolute value over here at point one. That vertical distance right there, Somewhere around 0.7 or 0.8 in absolute value would be the maximum absolute value there. Our error is going to graph is going to be negative. Let's color it green. There you see the error graph. The error can be thought of as a function itself. In absolute value, it's biggest, again, at 0.1. And this distance right there is the absolute value of that number right there, which is about 0.8. I could even call this error. Maybe I should even use the subscript for n here. Error 
sub n of x in general is f of x minus p sub n of x. And here I can just graph error 3 and get the same picture. I can also graph its absolute value. ABS stands for absolute value of Mathematica, just like in calcu most calculators. Color it something else. How about orange? So the orange graph now is the absolute value of the green graph. Yep, it's highest over here, and the absolute value is about 0.8. Is it exactly 0.8? I'm guessing not. Error. Error sub, sub 3 of 0.1 should be in the ballpark of negative 0.8. Its absolute value is positive 0.8. Close. Close to negative 0.8. So, and that's the biggest possible error if we took its absolute value over the interval from 0.1 to 0.9, you can see from the picture, the orange graph never gets higher than it is at 0.1. Is there a way we could figure out what the error is without technology? Turns out there is. There's something called an error bound. Labels it Lagrange error bound. Say Lagrange there. No, it's not, not Lagrange, Lagrange. Error bound says that the absolute value of En of x, where En is the error, in using the nth degree Taylor polynomial evaluated at x, and you try to approximate f of x. This is the absolute value, then, of f of x minus p sub m of x. But this is less than or equal to a certain number that we're going to call m divided by n plus 1 factorial times x minus a to the n plus 1 power, where what is m? where m is a bound on the value of the n plus first derivative of f evaluated at, uh, actually let me call the number t, over the interval between x and a. A is the number we're expanding the Taylor series around. In our example, it's 1. x is an arbitrary number. If f is a nice function, which basically means all its derivatives exist and they are continuous functions on top of that, then you can say this, where m, again, is an upper bound, a bound above for how big this derivative, the m plus first derivative, can get. The t is just an arbitrary number between x and a. So how would you, how would you apply that in this situation? Could, what would it mean to this situation? Again, f of x is natural log of x. We were using the third degree Taylor polynomial here on the screen to approximate f of x. f prime, again, is 1 over x. f double prime is negative 1 over x squared. f triple prime of x was positive 2 over x cubed. Those were the derivatives we needed to get to our third degree Taylor polynomial. 
n is 3 here. n plus 1 then would be 4. m is a bound on the fourth derivative of f over this interval. The fourth derivative is equal to negative 6 over x to the fourth. If you graph the absolute value of that function, the absolute value of the fourth derivative, which would be positive 6 over x to the fourth, over the interval, x goes between 0.1 and 1.9. What kind of graph are you going to see for this function? You're going to see a decreasing graph. Looks like that. It's going to be largest at 0.1, smallest at 1.9. So the M, an M that can work would be the value of this function at point 0.1, whatever that is, plug in x equals point 0.1. You're going to get a pretty big M here, and the bound may not be super useful, then we'll see what happens here. You can use M to be the fourth derivative of F evaluated at point 0.1, that's going to be 6 over 0 0.1 to the 4th. 0.1 to the 4th is going to be what? 0 0.0001? Is that right? Yeah, 1 ten thousandth. Which means this is going to be 60,000. M is going to be 60,000. Double check my math there. Is that right? So put it in here for M, 60,000. N again is 3, so you're going to divide by 4 factorial. And if I want a bound that's guaranteed to work over the entire interval, I can actually leave the X as an X. Plug in A equals 1 and get this. That's a bound that will bound, be guaranteed to bound the error over the entire interval. Bound the absolute value of the error. And then if you want to pick a particular value of x, like 0.1, just plug in 0.1 for x. So, what do we get? The absolute value of the error when n is 3 at point 1 is bounded above by 60,000. 4 factorial is 24. 60,000 divided by 24 times 0.1 minus 1 to the fourth power. We're still going to get a big number here. And so it's not a real useful bound, but it is a bound. What is that? 60,000 divided by 24 times 0.1 minus 1 is 0.9. Take its absolute value. 0.1 minus 1 is negative 0.9. Raise that to the fourth power. I'll go ahead and type it in like this. Negative 0.9 to the fourth. We take its absolute value anyway. Yeah, maybe I should just get rid of the negative sign. It's not a big deal here because it's the fourth power. The error bound to guarantee is about 1,640. Our, the absolute value of our error was much smaller than that. Much, much smaller. Okay? This bound is a guarantee based on some theory. It's not really useful for this example because our actual error is so much smaller. Though it is a guarantee if you want a guarantee. So what's the usefulness of this if it's so much bigger? Let's consider another example to consider the usefulness of it. I'm running a long time for lecture A. I hope I didn't make a mistake in my calculations, but I don't think I did. Anybody see any mistakes? So the guaranteed error bound is very, very big, which is not really useful. But this is still a useful error bound for some other reasons. Um, it's especially useful, I think, in the context when f of x is sine of x or cosine of x.
And in fact, if we consider the general case, Pn of x being a general Taylor polynomial to approximate of degree n to approximate sine. The m can take, be taken to be 1 because the derivative of sine of x is cosine of x, and the second derivative is negative sine of x, and the third derivative is negative cosine of x, and the fourth derivative is back to sine of x. These derivatives keep oscillating between sine, cosine, negative sine, negative cosine, and back to sine again. And we know those functions never get bigger than, than 1 in absolute value. So without even bothering to think about the graphs, although you could, with this kind of example, you could take m to be 1. We're taking a to be 0 here. We're thinking about this kind of thing. Although we're stopping at finding the finally many terms, degree n, whatever n it happen, happens to be. These only can contain odd powers, and n might not be odd. Just for the sake of argument, let's just pretend n is odd. And we get um, something like this if n is odd. And I guess the power of negative 1 should probably be what here? Um, probably, well, I'm not sure. I don't want to try to take the time to figure out what the power should be. It's either going to be an odd or an even number to make this sign correct. That's not my main point. My main point here is that the m can be taken to be 1 no matter what n is. And the a here is 0. So the absolute value of the error in using the nth degree Taylor polynomial to approximate the sine function is guaranteed to be less than or equal to 1 over n plus 1 factorial times the absolute value of x to the n plus 1. a is 0 here. And the key point about that is no matter what x is, x could be humongous, doesn't matter, the factorial goes to infinity so fast that even when x is large, this still goes to 0 as n goes to infinity, even when x is really large. We'd have to prove that. We're not proving that. We're trusting that. It's not an obvious thing, especially if x is large. But it's true. That expression goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. And the importance of that is that it tells you not only does the Taylor po po polynomial of any degree approximate sine of x well near 0, it also tells you that as n goes to infinity, the Taylor series equals the sine function no matter what x is. If I let this series go on forever, not truncate, consider the Taylor series centered at a equals 0 for the sine function. It equals the sine function no matter what x is because of the fact that this goes to 0 no matter what x is. As n goes to infinity, the error goes to 0. That's why the Taylor series for the sine function equals the sine function. And that, perhaps, is a more important application of the error bound so that you can be sure of that fact. Although in this case, if, you know, if x is close to 0, this will provide an, a bound for the error that is fairly small, as opposed to the other example we did. Okay. All right, let's end lecture A right there.